Well, then I will share this screen. Wow, it like announced that. That was interesting. Did you guys know we're recording? <laughs> so, um, can y'all see this? Cool. So um, you all know me, but uh, if you happen to be watching this video later, um, my name's Michael. I'm the lead of iOS at Solero Commerce. We're like the seventh largest payments processor in the United States or something like that. But uh, specifically, I work on a product called RazorSync, which helps field service uh, businesses manage their business and such. Um, and uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about XC Test. Uh, which is the uh, testing platform for uh, Apple platforms such as iOS, macOS, watchOS, tvOS, all those things. Wow, I thought that would continue on to the next slide. Okay. Um, does that do it? What the hell? Oh, I was on the end slide. Okay. That one worked. Um, cool. So, uh, well, First of all, we should probably talk about why you want to test anything in the first place, because there are plenty of shops that get along just fine without doing it, but those shops software could certainly be improved by tests and could probably save a lot of money for lots of different reasons, because it, uh, it takes lots of strain off of your manual QA team, uh, because they don't have to check everything for every change. Uh, you'll have a full suite of tests that can verify uh, what your, uh, that the changes you just make hasn't broken something somewhere else and actually works how it's intended to. Uh, so uh, do things like keep your uh, UX consistent across the app, uh, make sure your networking code works how it's supposed to, make sure all the algorithms in your app are functioning properly with any given data. Uh, you can test edge cases uh, more easily um, and such, and it just allows to, for uh, greater agility, and you can make changes faster with more confidence. Um, and XC Test makes this really easy. Now, uh, XC Test can do four primary different types of tests: uh, first, uh, logic tests, application tests, performance tests, and UI tests. Um, uh, the difference between logic and application tests used to be uh, rather large, like you in, in the olden days, you had to run logic tests in the simulator and application tests had to run on a physical device, but it isn't that that isn't the case anymore. So uh, the line is kind of blurred. So in practice, you'll be doing three major types of tests. Um, but uh, let's start out talking about those logic and application tests. Um, logic tests are commonly known as uh, unit tests, uh, and their purpose is to uh, thoroughly test individual quote units of logic, such as a method on a class, um, or uh, in general, I, I'll get into this in a second, what an XE test case is, but in general, um, I, uh, in my projects, uh, I have for every class or struct or whatever data structure like that, uh, I have one XE test, uh, XC test case subclass um, per structure that goes through and systematically tests all the things that it does. Ideally, your data structure shouldn't be doing all that much on its own, but that's a different topic that I think we're going to do next month. Um, but yeah, logic tests happen in isolation and from other tests. It's really important that there isn't really state maintained between the two tests. Um, uh, so that way you can verify that uh, state from previous tests isn't affecting the way your the code in your current tests operates. Um, uh, because if state was previous test was affect uh, state was affecting moose uh, current tests, you might get false positives or false negatives, and it'd be significantly less, less useful. Um, but uh, logic tests as well test code independent of platform. Uh, so, like uh, if you are calling uh, UI Kit APIs, for example, uh, your test isn't a logic test, that's an application test. Um, uh, so, yeah. Generally, you'll, for lo with logic tests, you can use the same test bundle for multiple different platforms, uh, which is as opposed to application tests, of course, which are uh, from other platforms known as integration tests. Uh, this verifies that systems in your app work together. Uh, you have integrated other code properly into your app. Uh, and application tests in the iOS world um, run uh, in, an in, in an actual running instance of your app itself. Uh, if you're 
still using the whole UI C, uh, like UI kit app delegate pattern as opposed to the newer Swift UI uh, app uh, format. Uh, you'll get like an instance of UI application and you can instantiate, uh, you will instantiate UI view controllers and such uh, and you can test your code as it runs in your app. Um, a key feature of application tests though is that it has access to device and platform features uh, such as you can use location or uh, camera, things like that in your tests and verify that that functionality works properly on the uh, device it's targeting. Uh, targeting. Um, with that being said, uh, you generally don't want to be writing or reading data from external sources too often, for example, the network. Um, it's gener generally speaking, you, sh you don't want a network connected test suite um, because uh, you that way you can verify it without a connection um, and uh, uh, your network code is already handled by Apple most likely through URL session. So there's no really need to test, test it again uh, because Apple already has for you. Um, their uh, logic tests and application tests are similar in that they are compiled into the same bundle in your code uh, and they run in the same processes as your uh, as your application. Uh, so you can actually uh, at testable import your application and in your application and logic test, you will get, um, you'll get access to uh, all the internal and public and open APIs that are in your uh, application so that you can test them. Uh, just like how you would a normal module, except you get access to the internal stuff as well. Um, however, you still don't get private or file private things. Uh, so be careful to um, uh, cover those in your tests of internal or public symbols uh, as well. A uh, good threshold is generally have about 80% code coverage um, and you can turn that on in uh, Xcode. Ideally you would have 100%, but if you have a number that you need to shoot for from zero, 80 is probably where you can start feeling good about yourself. Um, but yeah, uh, run the same process as your app. Uh, they uh, pass if no assertions fail, and they fail if any assertions within fail. Uh, and as I said before, they're a subclass of XC test case. So we can take a slight uh, detour into the, uh, uh, into, well, for, well, first before that, let's talk about um, what assertions you can make. Uh, you can assert that a data uh, and a piece of data is true. That's what XCT assert does. Um, uh, you can assert that uh, data is equal to another piece of data, not equal, greater than, or less than if they can form a comparable. Um, you can uh, assert that something is true or false. That's actually, XCT assert true is actually exactly equivalent to XCT assert. Uh, I believe XCT assert is just bridged over from objective C, which tests that it's not nil and uh, XCT assert nil and not nil. Uh, uh, bridges over as well to do a similar thing. Um, uh, however, they work with Swift optionals, um, so they effectively check that an optional is equal to nil or not nil. Um, and likewise, you have XCT assert throws error and no throw, which verifies that a section of code either does or doesn't throw an error given the data that you pass it. Um, over in the Objective-C world too, uh, I forget what the exact symbol is, but there's uh, one for testing that it throws an exception. Uh, or doesn't throw an exception. Um, however, that doesn't that isn't available in the Swift bindings to uh, XC test. So if you're trying to test for Objective C exceptions, then you'll have to use Objective C to test that. Um, also, a quick note: all of these functions allow you to pass a, a message as well as the thing that's being tested. Uh, highly recommend passing a uh, a message that will get displayed in the event of failure. Makes reading logs much easier um, and highlights in Xcode simpler. Um, but yeah, let's talk about XC test case for us uh, for a second, uh, because all tests are subclass of XC test case. And as I said before, it's generally a good practice uh, for every data structure you have in your app, it should correspond to exactly one XC test case subclass that tests everything that that data structure does. Um, and uh, but XC test case doesn't just test things. It does a lot of support work around setting up tests for things as well uh, and managing that. Uh, so before each test runs, um, uh, first of all, important to note, uh, every method 
that you define on your XC test, uh, XC test case subclass. Uh, in order for it to be con considered a test, it must start with the word test, the name of your method uh, does. So uh, for example, uh, if you wanted uh, uh, to um, test that a network call succeeds and downloads data, you can say test network call succeeds or something as your method name. And XC test case will pick that up as a test method that it's supposed to run and uh, will run it as a test. Um, any other methods that you define on your subclass will not be considered tests uh, and will not be run when you run your test suite. They're just helpers for your tests that you have written. Um, but before it runs each of its test methods, uh, it uh, calls setup with error and setup. Uh, setup with error is generally appropriate when you expect that uh, when, when the code that you're using to set up could possibly throw an error. Uh, if that happens, uh, up to you whether you want to XCT fail or XCT skip, um, which would either uh, fail the test if the uh, setup throws an error or skips the test if that happens. Um, and then afterwards, it calls setup, which doesn't throw any errors. Uh, just expects it to work, um, and then it'll run the test, log any fail, uh, log any of the failures it has, um, uh, and mark those as test failures. Uh, and then after e uh, it's each test, after each test, it gives you an opportunity to clean up any residual state that you've given. Because remember, you want every test to have a clean slate to start with. No, uh, you don't want any state persisting be between tests. So uh, there is a method on um, uh, XC test case called add teardown block, which is supposed to work much like Swift's defer statement, if you're familiar with that. Uh, it gives you the ability to write teardown code next to the setup code that you're writing. Um, uh, so you can keep that state kind of in one place managed. Um, add teardown code will be uh, uh, run in a last in first out order um, and all in the main queue, uh, though you can add teardown blocks from any queue. Um, but after that, it will call teardown uh, that doesn't that it doesn't ex expect to throw errors, and then teardown with error, which also can throw errors. Um, at this point, however, if you have assertions or anything like that, uh, I don't think they will be considered failures at this point if uh, if something fails. Um, so uh, be wary of that. Um, however, there is a flag on XC test case that uh, uh, called like continues after failure or something like that. If you set that to true. Uh, I believe it will still stop all your tests if a failure happens in a teardown. But um, yeah, you have these available to you in XC test case to set up tests and manage state. Um, and here's what an XC test case subclass might look like. Um, in this case, we're just testing that the toggle value succeeds in an optional. Um, so uh, uh, Notice that the XC test case subclass defines a property called test value, uh, which is an optional Boolean that it sets to nil by default. Um, and in setup with error, uh, very well could have done it in setup as well here. Um, it's just setup with error is what's default in the template. Uh, set test value to true as a, as a good initial value. And then in teardown with error as well, also just in the template, I could have done teardown here or add teardown block after in setup with error as well. Um, uh, sets it back to nil, which is the default value that we want every test to start with. Uh, and then our actual test method, test toggle, uh, goes through and uh, unwraps it, make sure it has a non-nil value first. And if it does, it'll fail the test and say that uh, uh, the test value is nil at the beginning of the test. Uh, and then um, just to verify that it has been set up properly, uh, it asserts that the uh, value is true to start the test. Um, uh, and then it attempts to toggle it as an optional. Um, uh, and notice that it, uh, I could have declared that as like guard ver or rig value instead of guard let, uh, which would allowed me to mutate a rig value, but I'm testing in this case specifically that it works in the context of an optional. Um, uh, so I didn't do that. And so I unwrap it again afterwards, make sure it wasn't set to nil for some reason. Um, and then assert that it's false at the end of the test. And you can see here that this worked properly. Uh, so there's a green check mark next to the test toggle method to show that the test passed. And since this is the only test on the Boolean tests class, uh, there's a green check next to uh, the class Boolean tests because all the tests on Boolean tests pass, passed.
So that's how um, logic tests and application tests work in XC tests. Um, but notice that these that this all happens synchronously. Uh, XC test also has support for make uh, for expecting things in an asynchronous manner. Um, this is necessary because normally the test methods uh, succeed after all the synchronous calls complete uh, in the test complete without failure. Uh, so if you have an asynchronous call that could fail, uh, like it has a callback or something, you won't have the opportunity to wait for it with just the tools that I've shown you now. Uh, and so it will think it will it pass even if it failed. Uh, in fact, it'll actually crash your test suite if it fails after the test ended. Um, but fortunately, XC test gives us an op uh, options to uh, test things asynchronously as well. Uh, in order to do this, uh, we want to generate an object that represents uh, an expectation and then configure any properties uh, that are necessary for it, such as uh, how many times that the test should be uh, fulfilled in order to consider it passed and uh, how, uh, whether or not uh, it should actually be considered a failure to fulfill it. Um, uh, those are some properties you can configure. Um, and then you want to config, uh, kick off your asynchronous operation and assuming it's a manual expectation, once the uh, operation completes, you need to call fulfill. Uh, if you think about it here, asynchronous expectations are actually a little bit logically inverted from regular expectations in that nothing happened means success. But with an asynchronous expectation, nothing, happen mean, nothing happening means a failure. Uh, so you have to manually tell an asynchronous expectation that this thing passed, um, as opposed to with a synchronous ex expectation, uh, you have to manually tell it that it failed. But anyway, once you kick off the asynchronous block, um, uh, you can uh, you need to uh, wait for all of your expectations to complete and set it a timeout. Uh, set a timeout, uh, and it will uh, wait for uh, all as it says it'll wait for all your expectations to complete and will consider it a failure if any of them haven't completed by the time it times out. Um, now, there are several different kinds of asynchronous expectations that you can uh, you can make. There is XC test expectation, which is the manual expectation I was telling you about, in which case you have to manually call fulfill yourself. Um, but there's also a few others. There's XCTKVO expectation, uh, which you give it a um, uh, a key path to uh, to observe, and it passes once um, the value at that key path um, is equal to a value that you also give it. Um, so you don't have to call fulfill; it will just watch it and un and understand when it uh, when it succeeds. Um, there's also an NS notification expectation, uh, and with that will uh, watch the uh, default notification center uh, for a uh, notification that you specify to be posted optionally with a uh, with an object to filter it as uh, with a normal NS notification, uh, and so it will pass when it hears the notification and fail if it times out. Um, and there's li uh, likewise a, a Darwin counterpart to it uh, as well. So uh, with uh, an NS notification center is built on top of a different concept called Darwin notifications, which are handled by the kernel. Um, and uh, it has an uh, expectation for Darwin notifications as well uh, through its uh, C-based API to notification center. Um, and then uh, it also, uh, there's one more uh, asynchronous expectation, uh, which is uh, XCT NS predicate expectation. With that, you give uh, you give it an object, and it passes once that object um, matches the predicate that you give it as well. So, for example, if you have a predicate that um, uh, requires an array to not be empty, and you give it a reference to an array, it will pass once a value is in that array. Um, uh, and again, don't have to manually call fulfill because it understands when the, it watches for when the predicate is fulfilled. Um, and so this is what an asynchronous expectation might look like. Uh, you can see that um, you actually, for, for these manual ex, uh, expectations, you don't actually instantiate the, uh, an XCT expectation yourself. Rather, you ask your superclass um, XC test case for an expectation uh, with a description. Uh, and so in this case, we've created a manual one uh, that asks uh, that uh, tests that data has successfully downloaded from Apple's website. Um, also notice here that the description 
uh, is used in the case that it passes and not the case that it fails. Um, and then uh, we just do a uh, network call to apple.com. And when it succeeds, uh, uh, you first of all assert that the data was not nil, that it downloaded. Uh, you can totally use synchronous assertions within your completion block because remember your test is waiting for it now. Um, and then once the completion block uh, is done, you uh, fulfill the expectation and that allows the waiting that you call at the end to, uh, to stop. And so if uh, the uh, expectation is fulfilled before the time out of five seconds here, uh, it will pass. But if it takes more than five seconds, it fails. Also, I know I said before that um, you shouldn't be hitting the network in your tests and that definitely holds true here. Um, this is an example in a presentation I gave and not production code. So um, don't do this. Generally, you would want to mock URL session to return a data task that doesn't actually hit the network and just calls its uh, completion block with data that you want to uh, have. But again, different talk for likely next month. Um, but uh, now moving on, uh, the third type of tests that XC tests uh, can perform are uh, performance tests. Um, we've all had bugs before where our uh, app just slows down for some reason. Uh, I know I dealt with one uh, in my last job, uh, end, of, um, end of December of last year, I think. Uh, and I spent a solid week trying to trace down the problem. Uh, whereas likely if I had good performance tests, it would have saved me so much time. Um, unfortunately, we weren't doing testing back then, except for manual QA work. Um, so I had to spend a lot more development time than was really necessary tracing down this problem. Uh, and performance tests would have helped. Uh, measures, uh, performance tests measure the runtime effic efficiency of your code. That doesn't, uh, that doesn't really mean like the time it takes to run, but uh, it can also record different metrics uh, like CPU usage, things like that. We'll get to that in a second. Um, uh, but uh, it provides concrete metrics to uh, the, uh, things that ha happened while your test, while your code was running. Um, and it records those changes over time. So the first time you run a performance test, it actually won't even, it won't really give you any meaningful data. Rather, you're going to use the first test as a baseline that all the others are compared to. Um, and it runs your, uh, code under test multiple times to make sure that, um, different system conditions haven't affected it. Um, and uh, it actually like logically takes a similar amount of time for each run. Um, uh, if there's a uh, there's a threshold of a standard deviation that you can set, if the standard deviation is too far off, it'll consider the test failed. Um, but there are several different me uh, metrics that you can measure with uh, uh, XE test performance tests. Um, of course, the one that comes to mind and the one that is the default if you just call self.measure uh, is XCT clock metric. Um, that's just literally the wall clock time it takes for your code to run. Uh, but you can also measure things like CPU usage, um, RAM usage, uh, the persistent storage that it uses, so how much data your uh, app writes to the disk, um, uh, how long it takes your application to launch, and time between OS signposts. Uh, if you are uh, familiar with um, the uh, modern logging system that was introduced in uh, iOS 10, uh, you can uh, set you can set specific markers in your code that things like instruments can pick up on, um, and things like performance tests can pick up on, um, and use those spots as markers for like, hey, a significant thing is happening right now. It just started, and also it just ended, uh, and go back and collect metrics in things like XE test and instruments. Um, so this is what that code might look like. Uh, this is uh, we're measuring. Uh, the performance of our toggling and optional Boolean. Um, you can see that I collected metrics for the clock metric, the CPU metric, and the uh, memory metric. However, in the screenshot here, I've been sh uh, only showing the uh, clock time. You can see that um, the uh, ran 11% uh, 11, uh, 11 faster than um, the uh, previous baseline that I had set. However, that's not really all that meaningful because just flipping a bit happens lightning quick and that's only going to be affected more by system condition than just about anything. Um, tiny things like this aren't really great candidates for performance tests. Rather think of um, uh, things that are not out of the one runtime, uh, 
um, would be good for a performance test um, and uh, processor heavy things, RAM heavy things would be good for a performance test. Uh, things where you foresee that there could be an issue in the future, um, you might want to put under a performance test. Um, but you can see that this one passed and it passed very, very quickly through five runs. Um, uh, so the last kind of test that XC tests helps you cover is uh, our uh, UI tests. And these are kind of unique compared to the other ones. Um, they exist to verify the usability of your app's user interface. Um, but uh, they're unique in that they're compiled into a separate bundle and run to, in a separate process. And you cannot import your app's code in these. You don't have access to your app's code. Um, rather, you're writing tests to use your app as a user and make sure it is usable and does the things that the user is expecting it to do. Uh, so uh, you can generate these from recorded user actions because ultimately your tests are going to be written like user actions. If the user is supposed to swipe on something, your test is supposed to call like app.swipe left. Um, uh, and you're going to encode, navigate through your app as a user. But an interesting benefit of this is since it has a running instance of your app, uh, hooked up to a debugger, it can do interesting things like generate artifacts for uh, other purposes, like screenshots, or um, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, localization flows in uh, in Xcode, um, it can take screenshots in multiple different languages and like highlight the things that um, your uh, uh, translators are supposed to be translating, so they have a visual representation of uh, how it's going to look in production. Uh, which is uh, helpful for them because uh, different things can mean uh, can have multiple different words in non-English languages. Um, like, um, for example, the word free. Um, uh, asking the question, are you free? Uh, could mean like, are you available? Or is the seat free? Uh, is the seat available as it or does the seat cost money? In Swedish, for example, that's two different things. To ask, um, uh, uh, is this seat available, or is this seat free, as in, in this seat, is the seat available? You ask, er, uh, er her, den her stolen ledig? Um, but to ask if it's free, as in, doesn't cost any money, it's, er den her stolen gratis? Um, and so it can provide useful context to your um, translators in that way. No, I went off a little side tangent, can be another talk for another, another day. Um, but anyway, uh, it makes these makes, make use of the accessibility APIs. And another tangent I want to go on in this talk is that if your app is not accessible, it is not production ready. Um, your uh, iOS is used by many, many, many different people of various ability and disability. And uh, if there are several people, lots and lots, who use assistant, assistive technology to use iOS uh, and to not make it accessible, uh, to them, uh, just alienates them. It's not a great feeling to uh, to be reliant on assistive technology and just not being able to use an app that everyone else does uh, because they're not they're they're disabled and can't do that. Uh, in fact, uh, in in the United States at least, it's likely a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act to not implement accessibility properly. Uh, so you could be open, opening yourself up to uh, uh, up to um, liability legally as well. Um, so again, if your app is not accessible, it is not production ready, and it's also not ready for XCUI tests. Um, uh, so before you can implement these, uh, you should go through and audit your app's accessibility uh, and add identifiers and accessibility labels and things like that uh, and make sure it works well with voiceover, switch control, um, all the accessibility settings in iOS, because not only do your users rely on them, your UI testing code will rely on it as well. Uh, but uh, XE UI test is still kind of similar-ish to um, the other kinds of tests. It's still a sub subclass of XE test case. So technically all the same APIs that you will, uh, that are available to you in UI tests uh, or in regular tests will be available to you in UI tests. They'll also technically be available to you in uh, regular tests as well. They'll just crash if you try to use them, uh, I believe. Um, and it can also measure uh, performance uh, as usual as well. Um, uh, for example, if you remember in the type of performance metrics uh, 
uh, in that slide uh, that you can collect. It had one for application launch time. That's only really useful in um, UI tests because in UI tests are the only time that you'll be launching your app from scratch uh, and you can measure that. Uh, and so uh, speaking of the UI test lifecycle, um, uh, you have to manually instantiate your app every time uh, for, for each test that runs. Uh, UI tests can take much longer than regular tests uh, because uh, it, ha it restarts your whole app for each and every test, which could be hundreds of things. Um, also be sure to have a mechanism to uh, have the app uh, reset persistent data at launch, um, such as like adding a command line argument that's picked up in your um, application did finish launching with options method. Um, that can go through and clear out all the user defaults, clear out any local data stores, uh, any other caches you might have, because again, it's important to be starting from scratch. Um, uh, however, it's also more okay to do things like writing to disk and call, make, making network calls and things like that, uh, because you don't have any access to stop that. Uh, you can, um, if you would like, do the same mocking things excuse me, within your app based on a command line argument or things like that. Um, but uh, that's, it's your call on whether or not that muddies up your uh, shipping runtime code um, uh, too much for, for this. It's generally okay to have network code and things like that in UI tests. Anyway, once you have your app loaded up, uh, you uh, programmatically uh, perform actions as a user. Again, you're not calling your internal APIs, but rather uh, making calls as if you're doing things a user would, like tap this button or swipe left on this thing. And then uh, you make assertions about the state of the UI once you've done those things. So you can use um, uh, all the assertions from logic tests and application tests, and this is where it will come in handy. Uh, so like if you have like an onboarding flow or something like that, uh, you want to swipe left um, uh, four times and then you're done with it. I uh, want to make sure that the uh, main view has presented after onboarding. You can programmatically swipe left four times and then look up the main view in the view art hierarchy and check that it exists and assert that it exists. And if it doesn't, your test will fail. And if it does, your test will pass. And then you can optionally collect attachments through here. Um, so you can do something like take a screenshot and, uh, save that to, uh, uh, a, uh, test, uh, directory once it's done that collect, uh, you can collect all your assets and review them in the future. Um, yeah, this is what a UI test, uh, looks like. Um, still has the same setup with error, um, and we'll also, uh, we'll also have the same teardown. Uh, I just didn't include that in here. It looks like. Um, probably should have done that. Um, but again, this is just a demo for a talk. Uh, this isn't actually production code. Um, but in the setup, I created an instance of my app. Uh, that's what happens with XUI application, uh, launch and activate. Um, uh, the difference between launch and activate, they technically do the same thing, except launch will kill your app and restart it. Um, if it's already running and activate will not. Um, uh, and then in UI tests, it's, if something fails, uh, it, you probably want to stop after that because after that you're in likely an inconsistent state, uh, uh, and can't really get out of it. Uh, so, uh, don't want to continue testing other things if something fails. Um, uh, and then, um, uh, the test actually happens here in test launch, uh, in which uh, we check to see that uh, the app is not nil. Uh, so if it is, we can fail the test and say uh, the instance couldn't be created. Uh, and then um, in this app, um, it was uh, uh, all it does is load up an arrow that points one way or another and says left or right. I was going to make a demo app for this talk, but I kind of, due to internal changes at my office, I kind of got a, uh, a lot of stuff dumped on me last week and felt really burnt out over the weekend and didn't end up uh, building that properly. Um, but uh, in the shell of the app that I made here, uh, it checks that uh, that label that says left or right uh, exists uh, in the in the hierarchy after launch uh, and uh, asserts that it's there. So if for some reason it didn't appear uh, after launch, uh, 
uh, this would fail. Um, and then afterwards, uh, it takes a screenshot of what it looks like and uh, marks it for Xcode to hang on to it so we can go back and review it later. Uh, and then, of course, it also tests the performance uh, uh, for that it takes to launch the app. This is a super basic app, just using uh, SwiftUI's new um, app structure. Uh, it's a pure SwiftUI app, no UI kit at all. So it launched super quick, on average 1.36 seconds, as you can see. Um, so uh, yeah, that's what your average UI test might look like. And uh, not quite done here yet, though. To bring these all together, uh, you can create something called a test plan uh, in which uh, it describes a single run of your tests and lists out things like environment settings, uh, configurations, all the tests that should be run. Um, you can create different configurations for here, like say if you just want a smoke test that uh, run that tests a few things uh, or a full test that tests uh, all the tests. Um, or specific subsections of features in your app, you can create configurations and test plans uh, to cheat, pick and choose uh, which tests you're going to run and the system conditions at the time when they do run. Um, and so you can configure quite a few settings. Um, uh, I know I said this a second ago, but uh, you can choose which test bundle should be run and test within a particular bundle that should be run. Um, you can also, in later versions of, uh, of Xcode, allows you to uh, execute all these kinds of tests in parallel. So instead of doing them uh, synchronously one after the other, which could take forever, like up to I, large applications could take hours potentially uh, running all their tests back to back to back um, if they were done synchronously. But Xcode allows you to do them parallel in, in, in parallel in some cases, in which case it launches multiple versions of the same simulator um, and tests those at the same time. Uh, which could uh, cut your test time into a fraction of what, what it would be if you did them all back to back. Um, but you can also uh, uh, specify what data the app should have at test time. Um, and you can also specify if any new tests that you write should automatically be added to the test plan, test plan because by default test plans are static and you'll have to manually add things but you can configure it to for, uh, for Xcode to pick up when you write a new test method and automatically add it to the plan. Um, so um, this is a screenshot of all the uh, environment settings that you can uh, create uh, for a specific test plan. And you can see just the diversity of things that uh, you can configure in this. Uh, you can uh, do what uh, launch arguments you want. So like if you're doing the UI test, you can pass the uh, launch argument that you want to set here. Um, if you're doing localization, you can test that your app looks good and works in tons and tons of different regions. Uh, ideally, every region that you support um, uh, has things for uh, UI testing, um, what happens to attachments afterwards, um, uh, execution order and timeouts for your tests, um, code coverage uh, with um, I think I mentioned this before, but uh, Xcode allows you to um, uh, turn on code coverage and it will gather uh, while it's testing what portion, what portions of code are being run. And then when you go back to edit your production code in Xcode, it can highlight, hey, this block of code here is never hit by any test. You may want to fix that. That's what code coverage is. Uh, and then it can even do uh, really low level things to catch um, uh, fairly esoteric programming errors, like the address sanitizer and the thread sanitizer to make sure you're staying uh, on the uh, same threads that you need to uh, uh, make sure your app's thread safe um, and not app, uh, accessing memory outside its uh, kernel pages. Um, uh, runtime APIs like the main thread checker um, and memory management things to make sure you haven't done any use after freeze. So like uh, you've requested data and then tell the system you don't need any more and then use it again, um, uh, things like that. Um, but uh, that is uh, the, uh, the majority of what XC tests can do. Um, uh, and I hope it has been a uh, useful tool to you in uh, getting started on bringing your current app under test. I think you uh, have a lot of benefit from it going forward. Um, so again, uh, I'm Michael, and that was an overview of XD test.
Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Good Ooh. job, Jeff. Thank you. Y'all have any questions? Uh, can I ask a couple sort of newbie questions because I don't really know much about XC tests at all, and, and uh, but um, I'm assuming you're putting all these. Um, so each 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 type of test is going in its own um, uh, file and a directory, and then you're just calling that class. Um, and then how is that getting run? Is that at build time, or is that just um, separately like you just run the test? So you uh, would generally command you to uh, run the tests and then XC test goes through and sees, oh, you've made this XC test case subclass, that must be part of the test, and then goes through each of those subclasses and sees which methods start with the word test and sees, oh, this must be part of a test also. And it uses that to um, build a list of what things it should test, or alternatively, it uses the test plan you've already defined to uh, figure those things out. Um, and runs all the tests that you have specified. Um, it doesn't happen at build time. You have to consciously do that and load up either a simulator or on your device or something like that. Gotcha. So, I'm the only one. Cool. Well, cool. Thanks, man.